Okay, everybody, welcome to the Soybean Gall Midge series. This is the second in our series of uh, three webinars. Today is going to be focused on ecology and plant injury issues. I'm Bob Wright, an entomologist with the University of Nebraska, and I'm the moderator today. We'd like to acknowledge Phyllis Bongard, who helped, helped with a lot of behind the scenes work, the registration website, uh, CCA credits, and all the other, other things that make this look like a professional uh, event. Uh, and then we also like to acknowledge, if you were saw earlier some of the slides, all of our different sponsors who've supported the research they're gonna be talking about today, including specifically uh, the North Central Soybean Research Program, the United Soybean Board, several state soybean associations, the North Central IPM Center, uh, USDA NEFA, and our industry sponsors. And uh, this was a new pest and we were able to get uh, a fair amount of funding rather quickly to address this, which is why we have some, some beginning answers for this problem. Uh, we'd also like to thank all the soybean farmers who've cooperated with us in gathering this data uh, it's really important that we do work in commercial fields so that it's relevant to what's going on in the field. And uh, also because we don't know how to rear this in the field or in the lab so we could artificially infest plots like we do with some other insects. Uh, so that, that's really been a, a key to our advances so far as, as our work with uh, various growers, uh, crop consultants and industry agronomists. And so we do, this This is titled a discussion. We do wanna get your input and interaction. There's a, a tab at the bottom of your screen that's Q and A. As people are talking, you can uh, type in your questions in the Q and A uh, window and then we'll address those at the end of each presentation. We have two presenters from University of Nebraska who will present as a team and, and a presenter from Iowa State University and we'll pause at, at the end of those two blocks. So if you have questions, uh, write them in the Q&A uh, block. As you may have seen, uh, again, with the introductory slides, if you want CCA credits, uh, Phyllis will put a, a link in the, uh, I think she's just putting this in now in the chat box as a Google form you can fill out to start getting the CCA credits. Also will be a QR code we'll show at the end of the session that you can uh, just scan directly from the screen. And uh, after, the, after you've uh, heard the presentation, you can get your CCA credits that way. This presentation is being recorded. And so if you have friends who registered and weren't able to attend, uh, they can see the recorded session uh, at the same platform, the same website where you registered, also on the soybeangallmidge.org website that we'll talk about several times today. So I think that's enough introductory comments for now. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Justin McMechan from the University of Nebraska and also Vilma Montenegro will be part of his presentation later on. So Justin, do you wanna get us started? Thanks Bob for the introduction and, and uh, providing everybody with the background information. I'm, I'm Justin McMechan uh, and I'm gonna give you uh, an overview of some of the life cycle and ecology work. And as Bob uh, said, and as we've been saying through this whole series, this is a new pest. And so there's a lot of information. We have the word ecology in here, but biology probably would have been as suitable for that given what we'll be discussing today, but we're drawing what we can. And uh, we know all of you will have a lot of questions today. So I, I and the rest of us greatly appreciate uh, you being part of this discussion with us. Um, I'll, I'll begin here by uh, actually taking you kind of through the life cycle and bouncing out to studies related to that particular stage of development and what we know so far um, and uh, encourage lots of those questions. So uh, this is something that we, we took for granted, I think, on a lot of other insects that we're, we're learning as much as we can about soybean gallwitch, but even just the basic life cycle you see in front of you and teasing out the various stages that are on here uh, has, has been a fun experience for all of us. I'm going to start this conversation uh, with adults and, and we're going to move through this cycle in a, a clockwise pattern 
talking about each one of these stages. And Vilma is going to cover the larval stage, which is really the damaging phase of this, this insect. And, and uh, the goal is to provide you pieces of information. So starting with the adults at about a quarter of an inch long, uh, you're, you, again, from previous sessions, you're not likely to see these, and uh, highly unlikely to see these in the field. Um, and we, we do a lot of our tracking with adult emergence cages. And so we'll begin with them. Their, their emergence in the spring is uh, our first chance and really the majority of what we're doing and, and basing any viable control strategies is on, on their inter initial interaction uh, and emergence uh, with this year's soybean fields. Uh, and so we'll, we'll begin the conversation with them. And I'm, I'm gonna begin with this because I know many of you on this call uh, or on this Zoom are really interested in, in how to manage this pest. And this is where it begins and with the soybeangalmage.org website that is linked to uh, a Blackboard Connect system. And I've, I scanned briefly the, the participants, a number of you were on that network already. Those of you that are not, this may be the chance to join. Um, what we do is we push out an automated phone call, text message, and email when we first collect adults in the field with these emergence cages. And this is one of the tops of those emergence cages with the, the glass jars where we initially catch adults. We have found no other successful method to collect adults with yet, but we provide information on that first emergence as well as scouting and management. So if you go to that web page, click on join the alert network, I'll add you uh, to that, that network. Uh, and, and I want to spend just a brief moment covering uh, what you'll see on that network or on that web page during the course of the season, which is two separate maps. We're going to really break down uh, these maps over the course of, of the early part of this talk. But one is overwintering uh, generation you see there on the left. And that's the adult emergence from last year's soybean fields. This is the one where a lot of the tactics are based on. Uh, and the other one is first as well as second generations from this year's soybean field. We track those numbers and, and provide you that information. But really at that point in the season, we're not looking necessarily at, at uh, a lot of viable management strategies uh, anymore. Uh, and so I'll begin this conversation first by looking between two fields, which is what many of you do and are seeing in, in pressure coming from one field to another. So in the closer part of this image down in the bottom here, you see corn stalks. This is from last year's, uh, you know, or this year's field going to soybean, last year's corn field. And over here is, is soybean stubble. And you'll notice there's an array of cages out into the field here. This, this is a study that we conducted early in the process of working with soybean gallmish to say, where is it coming from? You'll notice there are cages in the ditches between these two fields as well, because many of you said, you know, pressure came what appeared to be out of the ditches. And then as well along densely wooded and heavy vegetated areas where we see pressure during the course of the season. The results uh, do not require any statistical analysis on this, which is nice for all the researchers that are working on this, because what we've really seen is everything is coming from last year's soybean field. I really want to hammer this point home uh, because it, it comes from, that's where risk is coming from on any given season, uh, is that last year's soybean field. So where you experienced injury this past year, that's where they're overwintering in the soil. We'll get to that later. Um, and we just picked up a small percentage outside. The larvae can move when they fall off the plant. And we've done some studies this past year and have now a grant to address that more fully here in the coming years. Um, but even in 2020 here, that's 2019 data you see there. 2020 was 100% in last year's soybean field. We have some other hosts. So we do expect to pick those up along the borders as well or in ditches. Um, and so we'll be targeting those as well in the, as well in the coming year. If you take anything away from this presentation uh, and you're, you're looking at the management side of soybean gallmage, this is the, the most important slide in front of you, uh, in, in my opinion. And, and it is not only the first date of emergence, which can vary year to year. And, and granted, we have two fairly close dates, uh, but uh, you know we, we anticipate somewhere in June this thing will emerge, but uh, the exact dates are not uh, uh, for certain or anything that'll be within that period of these last two years. But what's most important is the duration of emergence of this insect from last year's soybean fields. So it's this year's corn field. That emergence uh, can span a period from 15 days in 2019, which was long but acceptable. Um, whereas in 2020, up to 25 days on average is really 
in a period for anybody working in management, having an insect come from another source for that long a period makes management very difficult. Uh, across our network, what you saw in the map, we can see activity across all of that network within nine days. Some sites may not, but uh, at least in all states. And uh, in some cases at particular sites, we went up to 34 days of emergence. We're hoping 2020 was a unique year uh, that some dry periods possibly, there's a lot of theories out there on or, or hypotheses on why that might be happening. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that may be something that led to that. And, and I think more years of, of data collection on this will, will help us better understand that. Um, I'm gonna start first with 2019. If anybody's watched presentations in the previous year, this is a very familiar graph to all of you. On the bottom is, is the dates. Uh, and you'll see that June 14th was our first collection date of any adults. Uh, and on the side is the number of soybean gall midge adults that, that emerged on that particular day across uh, where the East Central Network, where we got the abundance of adults collected uh, during that season. Uh, first thing I wanna highlight, I'm gonna do this a lot, is, is uh, overwintering generation coming from last year's soybean field. You can see that duration of emergence, kind of a quick peak, uh, and then along kind of lower levels of emergence uh, into the first part of July we get a brief break and then we actually see uh, a first generation emerge from this year's soybean and even a second. And we captured that with the planting date study uh, to know there was a second generation cycling through last emergence in September. So a long period of, of, of adult activity, uh, but, but some brief breaks in there uh, in a few places during the season. We'll contrast this now with, with 2020 where we saw across the network a 225% increase in the number of adults collected. Uh, and you'll notice that I don't have the generations in indicated except for what is overwintering and first and second. Um, it, it was not possible to tease apart uh, those, those separate generations because of the extended amount of emergence and overlap between the two generations. So if you look uh, between this year's soybean and last year's soybean fields, You'll notice we have a significant period of overlap um, in, in between both of those. And, and so that made it difficult. Although the starts and ends of, of adult activity are very similar between the two years. And so hopefully that paints a picture for you. This, this drop we saw here and then increased with some dry periods. So we were kind of hypothesizing that may have slowed down a bit of emergence, but it's really too early um, to, to draw a lot from that with only two years collected. So that's adult emergence. You know, they're emerging from last year's soybean fields. They're moving via wind, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, they're not great flyers. I think that was one of the questions asked earlier. We don't know how far they move. Uh, there's some indications from other species, but uh, then they're interacting with, with this year's uh, uh, soybean plants. And so this is where egg laying comes in. Uh, and there's some unique things. And somebody asked this question in the last session, is there things related to plant development? So you see here a contrasting picture between V1 and V2 stage plants. And as Bruce noted, there's a bit of herbicide damage to this V2 stage plant. We applied warrant in that field. Um, we don't know, you know, obviously without those herbicides, we get uh, infestation, but herbicides are a question that has been asked. Um, but you'll notice this cracking that forms. There's no cracking visible or fissure development below the cotyledonary node in this photo. Whereas you see it here, as we get closer, it's more apparent these fissures or cracks. Um, and, and even more so under a scope, uh, but you'll initially pick up those eggs in those areas. Obviously this is further along because we have orange larvae present, uh, but that's the initial points of infestation. Um, if any of you have ever seen the time lapses, this is actually a snapshot from that time lapse where we uh, put it on plants that didn't show any signs of infestation. What you get is an initial black formation around where that fissure is present, quickly wraps the plant, uh, over a period of time. And uh, as a result, that that's the, appears to be the initial points of infestation. Uh, an adult female here in the center, this is like the third picture we took on soybean gallmage. A female, obviously, with a very long ovipositor. Um, but again, they're not piercing tissue. They're laying these, these eggs into natural openings. And I popped up raspberry cane midge that uh, Dr. Tom Hunt brought up in the first session. Uh, the same observations are made with it. It's laying its eggs into natural openings uh, on, on the plants. So we're gonna transition now to, to Vilma Montenegro, a master's student in my lab, and she's gonna go over the seasonal abundance of, of larvae. This is a first year study, uh, so things can change, uh, but I'm gonna hand it over to Vilma. I'll advance the slides for her and mute myself uh, 
um, and she can tell you a little bit about the seasonal occurrence of larvae on plants. Thanks, Justin. Uh, as Justin mentioned, I am Vilma Montenegro. I am a master's student in uh, the Department of Entomology in the University of Nebraska. So um, due to the research that I had to conduct for my master's, I have been involved in the research related to soybean gallmage since uh, 2019. And I have a couple of projects related to soybean gold meat management that I'm going to be talking about uh, the next Tuesday. But today I want to focus in the season larval abundance of soybean gold meat. So this is a specific study that I've been conducting. Um, you can go next. So this study was mainly conducted with the objective of understanding the abundance of soybean gold meat in plants over the season. So basically being able to know um, the number of larvae that we were able to find on plants and also um, finding those peaks or those times where we will find really high numbers of larvae or the lowest numbers of larvae in which period of time uh, we will find the larvae in the field. So all of that is, uh, I'm going to be providing a summary about this uh, during this presentation. Uh, this is, oh, that's a little messed up for some reason. Um, this study was conducted in two locations. We had one in, uh, in Eastern Nebraska. Um, we have one in Davie and another location near Memphis, Nebraska. And this timeline that for some reason is all messed up, uh, was just to give you an idea of the period of, of time that this study covered. So basically we started the experiment by June 10th and that in all the sampling was going on through the entire season until we were pretty close to harvest which was in uh, by the end of september so if you are um in the soybean gold alert network you will remember that you received that alert that soybean gold was being found in um in the field by June 12th, June 13th, that was our first uh, detection. So by this time, we were already collecting uh, information for this study and we just continued during the season until a few days prior to harvest. Uh, so for this study, what we were doing, as you can see in the first picture, we were basically collecting infested stems uh, from the field. So we will collect series of infested stems, uh, put them in those conical tubes and bring them to the lab. So we will count the number of larvae per plant. And we were doing this uh, every couple of days, as I mentioned, during the entire season. And uh, uh, I said we had two locations, that one in Davie and another one near Memphis, but I'm going to focus only in one of the locations. So in the, uh, the Davie site, we observed similar results. So uh, this should give you a, a pretty good idea of what was going on in both of the fields. And here I just want you to be mindful that as Justin said, this is only the first year of data. So basically last year was the first time we were conducting this study and we are doing it again this year. Uh, but what I am providing is what we have found so far, but we, we still need to be very careful and not draw, draw conclusions just yet. So first in blue, we have the overwintering adults and in gray, we have the first and second generation because remember we have these three generations. Uh, the overwintering adults are the ones that we collect very early in the season, like the first ones. And those we are going to be collecting from the fields that are planted with with corn the, the current year, because in a um, rotation between corn and soybean, this was the field that was planted with soybean the previous year. So the um, pupa of soybean gold was overwintering there. And then they are going to emerge the following spring as a, that's what we call the overwintering adult. So that emergence started in June 12th for this specific location. So basically, uh, and I actually think that this was one of the first um, one of the first locations in uh, for emergence. So during these these days, you were receiving the alert that soybean gomish was found for the first time in the year. Uh, and then the overwinter adults continue emerging emerging until the beginning of July. And then by July 3rd, we had the beginning of the first um, generation of adults. And it just continued all July, August, until the end of August. In this case, was August 22nd. And again, all these um, numbers that we can see uh, are marked in gray. Uh, all this was being collected from the current year soybean field. 
So this is basically the same graph. We are again looking at the adults, which are in yellow. But uh, here I also want to show you the numbers of larvae that we were finding during the season. So as I previously mentioned, we found uh, the first adult in this uh, specific site in June 12th. And only six days later, we were already able to find uh, the first uh, larva in the field. So basically, you were receiving that notification from the soybean gold Mitch alert that adults were found in June 12th. And then six days later, we were already able to find uh, larva feeding on the plants. And uh, this shows all the period of emergence during the year. So it ended by August 22nd in this field. And even though this was the last time we found adults, uh, we were still able to track larva until September 17th. So almost a month of larva still feeding on those plants, even though we were not able to uh, find adults anymore. So now let's see if this is the same graph. I just want to show you a couple of details about what was happening during the season. So a couple of events. Uh, first, the duration of adult emergence. Uh, for last year, we have 72 days of adult emergence. So those 72 days uh, mark the time since the first time we find adults until the last time. So all this time we were tracking and, and constantly finding adults in the field. Following, um, as I said at the beginning, it was only six days since the first time we found adults until we start finding the larva in the field. And at least in this uh, specific field that occurred when the crop was in V5 stage. Following, we have the duration of the larvae presence. So um, it, this is even a longer period than the adult presence. So we had only 72 days of adult presence, but the larvae presence, which actually matters the most because they are the ones that are feeding on the plants, was a total of 89 days. So basically they started being there in, uh, in middle August and they left the plants by the end of September. And uh, the for the last detection of adults, the crop was in an R6 stage. And the last time we detected larvae, the, um, the crop was in an R7 stage. So from here, we can see that basically those stage R6, R7 are still stages where the soybean gold mitch can feed on. And as I mentioned, we are able to track uh, the adults by using those cages that we set up in uh, several farms. And we can uh, keep you guys informed where, when and where we are finding those adults. And at least in this case, the last time we were finding adults in Davie was by August 22nd, but that was not the end of the presence of soybean gold mitch in that specific field because we were able to find a uh, larva the following 26 days. So uh, it's just something that you should keep in mind uh, that the fact that we are not able to find those adults in the field doesn't mean specifically that they, uh, the larva might not be there feeding on the plants. So as a summary for this presentation, uh, you have seen so far that it's been difficult to develop efficient management strategies. And uh, that is mainly due to the lack of knowledge in the biology and ecology of this new pest. But that is something that we are working really hard uh, uh, to gain more information. And from this study, we, could, uh, we were able to see that the first larval detection occurred at V4. And the last time we detected larva feeding on the plants was in the R7 stage. And uh, soybean gold mitch is present in most of the growing season. So as you, um, so let's say in this case, we had 111 days from the day we planted until the day we harvest the field. And from those 111 days, a total of 89 days was uh, some larva were present there feeding on the plants. And soybean gold mitch uh, larva can stay on plants almost a month after the, uh, the last adult detection. And uh, this is only one of um, many studies uh, that represent of efforts on learning about the biology and also the ecology of soybean gold mitch in order to, um, or main objective uh, that has been all this time to develop management strategies that can help you guys reduce economic losses caused by soybean gold mitch injury. So that is all I have for uh, this. I'm gonna let Justin continue. And Thank we you, Vilma. Later. Perfect.
Perfect. Yeah. If you have questions for Vilma, type them in the chat. I see a number of questions coming in and we'll, uh, we'll address those at the end. I have a couple more uh, things to address here. Uh, so, so Vilma did a great job, you know, on, on an initial first year of understanding uh, larval abundance over time. And in 2019, uh, we had Regina Stacchi, a scholar, join us from Brazil uh, to do some initial work on hail injury and soybean gall midge. Uh, because uh, Tom noted in his first talk that we we'd, he had seen some relationship between plant injury and the presence of larvae. And so we were applying hail using a simulated hail machine at uh, three different stages of development, very early vegetative prior to expecting adult emergence uh, in the midst of what would likely be adult emergence, uh, and then later in the season in the reproductive stages. Uh, and the goal of this study was to take these plants, uh, pull a random sample of plants, and look for injury points on those plants and see if those coincided with the presence of, of larvae on those, on those particular uh, samples. And so uh, what we found, uh, there are two graphs here. I'll have you focus on the one on the left on the uh, first. On the x-axis is the injury height on the plant, and on the y-axis is the larval height on that plant. And so you can see the majority of the times when we have an injury point on the plant higher than what's expected uh, or below the cotyledonary node where fissure development occurs, we can find larvae. Um, and that tells part of the story. Uh, there's a high correlation there, which means as those injury points are found higher on the plant, there's a greater, there's a significant likelihood we may find a larval presence. The other graph shows you that without hail or early applications all have similar total larval numbers per plant, but that late application, hail application, seem to have a greater presence of, of larval number. And, and granted, like, like Vilma's, this is a one-year study we were not able to conduct due to the uh, restrictions with COVID, but plan to continue this in the, the very near future. Um, we've, we've had reports of issues around areas where we've had hail the previous year, um, and, and those are good to have, but uh, it is increasingly important that we have these controlled studies to better understand uh, this potential relationship in terms of risk uh, for the number of overwintering larvae that may be present in a field. Um, and so we've kind of closed part of our, our discussion here now uh, on, on the larval abundance numbers and some things that may impact that. And I wanna spend the last part of this focused on, on the silken cocoon or overwintering stage, uh, which I have overwintering stage because that's important, but during the season, obviously when it's, it's going through its various life cycles, um, that, uh, that each time it does, it must go through this phase during the course of the summer or it's at least assumed. Uh, to understand the, 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 their presence uh, over the course of the winter and some distributions in the field, uh, we've done a, taken a number of soil samples using a core sampler uh, to a depth of six inches. And, and this project was uh, really uh, brought to fruition or value through collaborations with North Dakota State University and Janet Canodal and, and the group up there uh, helped us in the processing of these samples. And so uh, without that, this, this would uh, probably be still sitting in a fridge or freezer somewhere. Uh, so they've, they've allowed us to, to, to do that. Um, Tainara Possebaum, a research scholar in the lab, along with uh, Dea Montezano, who, Dr. Dea Montezano, who was a postdoc in the lab during that time, um, you know, were a large part of the efforts on this particular project. But what you see here are the uh, initial results from that project, which is the majority of the larvae are present near the soil surface, top inch and a half. We do find them further down although there's nothing indicating that they're viable from those depths to emerge. This is not unique to this insect and matches other insects that are related to this one. Uh, you can see our sampling area there, which was 520 and 50 feet. We did this at four sites uh, in East Central Nebraska. And we're fortunate we just received a USDA NEFA grant uh, to explore other aspects of this, which is, uh, as you may have noted, when Vilma showed an individual site, the, the larval number is quite low. Uh, per site, and, and we're wondering about the spatial distribution uh, of the overwintering cocoons in the soil. So we're going to do this rather intense high spatial sample uh, and cover that, that with cages and try and understand what their distribution is along those field margins, uh, which may relate to injury and other things. Uh, that study also has plans to study larval movement away from plants uh, by leaving open spaces uh, around them. 
So, so I, there's a lot happening in that particular project. There will be certainly more to develop on that over the next couple of years. And Mika Ellison is a master's student that will be joining us this uh, spring uh, to, to continue this project for the next couple of years. Uh, and I, I think it'll be tremendously valuable to our alert network as we go uh, forward. I'm gonna briefly mention uh, two other uh, hosts that um, we have identified uh, as having soybean gulmage present. Uh, Amy Hover, who is a Doctor of Plant Health student who joined us in 2019 for an internship, uh, led this effort uh, here in Nebraska, and uh, she identified sweet clover as a host. That's both white and yellow sweet clover. Uh, we subsequently followed up on that in 2020 and found a number of uh, plants, sweet clover plants, infested uh, up into Minnesota uh, with Bruce out in Iowa, and then in the northeast part of of Nebraska as well with Tom. Um, we did confirm these uh, for a while. We sat on these samples, uh, confirming the larval morphology with uh, Dr. Ray Gagne uh, doing DNA sequencing here at UNL and then uh, rearing adults only from sweet clover. We were not able to rear any from alfalfa. Um, you, you may wonder about these hosts in terms of the role that they represent to you in risk. Their, their role in the system isn't clear. I wouldn't uh, suggest that they are at high risk at the moment or, or anything like that or need management. Uh, and we'll certainly learn more about these in the, in the coming years. Um, but, uh, you know, they can find these present along ditch borders and areas. Uh, alfalfa, it's rather difficult to find them on alfalfa. We do find fairly low numbers. Sweet clover surprised us this past year uh, with some pretty significant numbers. But again, it's not clear that they can move from sweet clover to alfalfa in the same efficient manner as from or alfalfa from soybean as they can from soybean to soybean. So those host relationships and interactions uh, remain remain unclear. Uh, how does this match up with what we know about the other species in this genus? Um, it's it's rather unique in its present form, but uh, that may be a lack of research on the other species related to host range. Uh, so for for the genus Resiliella that that soybean gallmage resides in, the the host range for those species have really stayed within a plant family. Um, in this case, Fabaceae for for soybean gallmage. Um, and, and into a single plant, plant species, most of them are only known to exist on one, one genus of, of, of plants. So maybe there may be multiple species within that genus. Uh, rare cases where a few have been on a couple different genera. Uh, and with soybean gallmage, I've already mentioned uh, three different genera that this insect can be found on. Uh, and so we are already in kind of new territory, but that uh, may not be unique if we knew more about the host range of other other species. And I say theories on the bottom, that's probably too strongly stated. Uh, you know, hypotheses on where this thing came from is that it may have come from one of these uh, other hosts, but uh, there's some population genetics work that's underway that uh, honestly, it's a longer term answer than probably that study will immediately provide. But uh, we're working towards that progress of, of trying to figure out where this, this insect initially came from. There are those three original hosts. This is a a tree, all you need to know is the closer they are to one another, the more they are related. Uh, you notice sweet clover and alfalfa are on there. Uh, Phaseolus, uh, which uh, Bruce Potter and, and Tom Hunt initially in, in 2018 had found orange larvae on. We could not confirm them as, as soybean gallmage or didn't have samples to process, but this is an area dry bean is of considerable concern uh, to look at. And this past season, I was over looking at lead plant, a native host, which is ultimately what we're all after. Uh, and uh, could not find any on it, although we, we won't shut the door on that. Uh, and I know a number of us are interested in, in looking at native plants, uh, and Bruce uh, has plans to, to pursue that as well in Minnesota. So uh, there's lots uh, to, to talk about on this thing. And, and as you all know, with two years, there's a lot of things that are uh, you know, in the works ongoing. Uh, we have plans to look at the spatial distribution of larvae and soybean fields over the course of the season. Um, you know, the impact of the overwintering environment on survival and adult emergence, larval development time and temperature, as Bob mentioned, if we had a colony, that would be uh, far easier to do uh, and is needed. And, and granted, there's a wide range in other species like uh, Theobaldi, the raspberry cane midge has shown wide swings in its total duration for life cycle, depending on the temperature. Um, and so that's needed for soybean gallmage at some point. Uh, movement prior to pupation, as I mentioned, the USDA NEFA project is funding that. We're starting genetic sequencing even without funding and looking uh, for, to some sources this year for funding. 
and Ravneet Kaur, a uh, master's student with uh, Dr. Ana Velez and I is looking at that uh, and trying to understand that gets a little bit to origin. Host range studies, uh, which uh, I mentioned Bruce is working on and we've done a bit of work on that in here in Nebraska. Uh, I did not get a chance to mention today, although this is uh, more to the management direction is plant disease interactions, but this also relates uh, to this insect's uh, interaction with disease, which is not clear at the moment. Uh, those studies will take some more time to, to get any clear answers on it. Uh, adult emergence from these other hosts and what that might be, and then and the larval distribution and abundance on the different hosts. So uh, that's a sampling. There are probably uh, more outside of that, but that gives you an initial idea. Uh, so I'm going to close it off there uh, and open this up to, to the uh, set of questions that are in front of us. And uh, after we're done answering those, we'll, we'll go on to Aaron and Bob. You'll probably want to keep track of our time as we answer these. So we make sure we move on uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, do you know if the adults can conduct directed flight? I assume that means in relation to host finding. Yeah, um, I can I can start on that, and then I, I would encourage everybody else to kick in. Uh, you know, they obviously have very large eyes, so uh, it's it's quite possible they're they're visually orientating themselves towards things. They're not great flyers. Uh, but, but it's uh, evident from adjacent fields that they pile into an adjacent field and are quite concentrated along that edge. Um, that um, could be a result of maybe some chemical cue from soybeans that's coming over, directing them over there. But it appears that, that there would be some directed flight for that, that heavy edge. We have no, I'd have no direct research uh, to, to put that on besides the observations from, from each season. Um, others? Well, I think we haven't conducted any studies, so we don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a colony would be a great way to get to some of those uh, types of things. Okay, there's another question. Is there any indication that transgenic soybeans producing similar BT or similar toxins are protected? We haven't looked at that at all. We so, don't have any either two tests. So yeah, yeah. Yep. or at least not in the US. Nope. <clears throat> How far north do three generations of adults emerge in fields? That would be a good question for Bruce uh, and, and Bob. Well, they're, uh, we're, we're picking up, based on the appearance of the larvae, they're, they seem to be synced all the way up into the furthest uh, part of uh, west central Minnesota. Um, the, th the problem with that is, is, is our northern site didn't have uh, good emergence cage data but the larvae uh, in adjacent field showed up about the same time. Um, but I, I, it's a, just a short life cycle. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility they have three generations all the way north. The, the data on uh, Theobaldi raspberry cane midge, if the temperatures are cranked up for that particular insect, we don't know for soybean gall midge, but it can be as low as 16 days. Uh, and as long as 50 some odd days as the temperature drops, um, it, we could make the assumption on soybean gall, which no study's been conducted. But I think in 2019, it was evident, at least from adult emergence in last year's field to the first emergence, we were between 28 and 32 days. So that's enough time. Okay, next question is, how long is the life cycle of, of the adult female and how many eggs can each female live during their lifespan? We don't, we don't know the number of eggs laid. Uh, our, we did have a, a, an hour long meeting with Ray Gagne early on. I asked him a series of questions like this and he provided us estimations, although I don't know how much, you know, I think he indicated around 100 eggs per female. Uh, that is not known for soybean gall midge, which I should be clear on. Females only live a few days. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Dea Montesano was between two and three days and we were up to five in some cases. Uh, there's indications in the literature, unmated females may live longer, uh, which is what we may have been looking at. Okay, how many adult emergence monitoring sites are there or were there last year? <laughs> it varies year to year. I think, believe yeah. we have 36 uh, and that, that uh, varies depending on the sites that we're coordinated with. Uh, I encourage those that are in my area and others can as well, that if you have a site of interest or high pressure, we can't guarantee we'd be there, but having that information available to us that you have a site, we can properly orientate those sites geographically uh, to pick some of that information up. 
Okay, uh, since you saw a drop in the amount of soybean gall midge emerging during dry periods, if we have a dry year, do you think the numbers might not be as bad as big of a problem? How I've been will, answering a lot. I've been answering a lot of questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take second seat on this one and let a few others dive in. Uh, it's actually I, I learned from our one of our weather experts in Iowa last week that when uh, we go into the fall and winter with really dry soils like much of, of western Iowa, the soil dries faster uh, it freezes faster than it would if it were wet. And so um, I'm not sure what it means for the survivorship of midges that we're trying to overwinter right now, but I can imagine that if they if the soil freezes faster, that they might have actually a better chance of overwintering because they're, they're going into a very quick overwintering period. And then hopefully we'll get some moisture in the spring to kind of reactivate, <laughs> re resume development. I don't know how you guys feel about like fall, winter droughts, spring droughts and survivorships. I, I don't know if I have much more to add, Aaron. That's pretty complete as far as what we know now. I, I know uh, I had growers report this came through 2012 as an issue. Uh, in areas where they were dealing with it. That, that was a pretty good year. Uh, temporally, and Aaron brought up a good point, temporally when those dry periods occur might be uh, a different story. And we're getting a little long on time. I think I'll skip a couple of questions on control. That'll be discussed next week. Uh, what effect would no-till have on midge populations? Yeah, uh, that, that's actually kind of fit into management related okay. things. That I know both Bruce could weigh in on that. Uh, we've conducted some studies here. I think when we get through the tillage section on the 19th, that would be a good one to follow up on. And are larvae susceptible to colder winter weather? I think Aaron sort of talked about that. We don't have it. We've only had this for a couple of years, so we don't have a lot of data on that yet. Uh, but the fact that there are they're mostly in the soil surface suggests they might if it's cold enough. One thing we can do, Bob, is if we have, because I'm seeing questions in the chat as well, is we could yeah. also go through Aaron's presentation. And then I'm, I'm happy to hang around after and continue to answer questions as long as people are on. If others are, think that's okay, that way we ensure that those that want to hear the talks can hear them. Sure. Let's move on to the next uh, presentation by Aaron Hodson. We, we appreciate the questions, though. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bob. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm also happy to, to stay on. Um, there were some questions about some interactions with soybean aphid, which I'm also very happy to talk about. So happy to stay on today and also be there uh, next week for our third one. But just switching gears a little bit to expand a little bit on my discussion from the first brown bag, where I spent quite a bit of time uh, giving tips on when and where to look for soybean gall midge, especially if you happen to be in those fringe counties that haven't been uh, had a positive detection yet. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more about plant injury, what that might mean for yield losses associated with this pest, and, and ultimately I hope that understanding the injury can provide some management recommendations. I wanted to acknowledge my co-authors who helped support and provide a lot of data for this, especially uh, my graduate student, Mitchell Helton, who's co-advised by Justin. Right, so um, we did talk a little bit about, ew, sorry guys. Okay, so we did talk a little bit about injury and recognizing what an infested plant looks like. So I will uh, just briefly say, um, you know, they're focused on zero to six inches from the bottom of the soil. You'll see these dark lesions and weakened areas start to form. And then basically the, the plant is very stressed. And so you'll see visual signs of stress and uh, that feeding site can become very weakened and sometimes break off uh, or just straight up kill the plant. And so when you're walking up to a field, you may notice patches that are dead or strips that are dead along field edges. And then most people with, their, with the naked eye can see, especially third instars because they're bright orange and pretty visible, but you'll see obviously plants that, that don't look like the rest. 
And I just wanted to further uh, emphasize some of the points Bruce made last week about confusion with fungal pathogens. And I realize there's people from all over the Corn Belt that are attending this brown bag. And these are some of the things that we will see in Iowa. Um, they happen early, they can happen early in the season. And some of the visual symptoms can be confused with soybean gall midge initially. And so we just wanna make sure that people are understanding that you don't necessarily have to have diseases and midges at the same time, but sometimes you can have fields that have diseases, fields that have midges, and then sometimes both can co-occur. Co Plus you might have aphids and, and other pests that are feeding at the same time. So it would be important to learn to distinguish the uh, infections for midges. So we just wanna make sure that happens. And sometimes, you know, we're, this is still ongoing, but we don't understand if this is a synergistic relationship as far as like the yield is, uh, the yield impact when you have both at the same time. Um, but uh, most of our preliminary research has been focused on, on midges only. And then this is a, another great series of photos from Justin showing that basically plants can get infested almost any time of the year. So we've seen them as early as V2 or V3 and then throughout the entire vegetative stage. And then they can also get first infested in the reproductive stage. So this usually happens more in the field interior. So you could have actually plants that have, have the larvae in August and then depending on your maturity groups and all that, you could still see larvae feeding into September. So as plants have reached full seed set, they're starting to senesce and drop leaves. You can see larvae still um, feeding around this, the base of the soil. Um, we get a lot of questions about how long does it take from a, to, to go from a healthy green plant to one that is infested and maybe dies. And so I, I'm, I'm summarizing some data that, that Justin took on a really specific level using emergence cages. And so, um, so for example, day zero would when, when he would be capturing adults. And it's about nine days later that you would start to see some of those clear uh, younger first in, and second in stars present. And then you would start to see some of the, the stem starting to look stressed and with black and lesions. About 12 days after that, uh, after initial adult capture, you would start to see the third and final larval instar. So that's the wrapping up that larval feeding and those lesions are expanding and, and weakening the plant. And it's about 20 days after adult capture that you really start to see the lesions impacting the plant. Sometimes they break off or sometimes the plant just dries up and dies. So on a very, this, this is highly variable. Um, you know, how many larvae does it take to kill a plant? We don't understand that. That you could imagine that how many larvae on a small plant would be very different than say a plant that's infested later. But uh, just ballparking it here from the work that he's done, um, we're guesstimating about three weeks from when, you know, you first start to see uh, adults and eggs laid to when you have a, a dying or dead plant. And then uh, one of the most common questions I get is, is the yield impact from this pest. And I thought he did a nice job of taking some, Justin did a nice job of taking some super detailed notes on metrics for soybean. And so he took, this is an example of something, a, a lot of work happened in 2008 from a commercial field that was very heavily infested. And he was taking measurements of these plant metrics right at the field edge. And that's where we would first expect to see them. And then more samples into the field interior. So if you just look at the brown line, which is the average, you can see the distance near the edge all the way out to 400 feet. Plants are shorter at the edge, and then they also have fewer nodes. And ultimately what this means is fewer pods and fewer seeds. So this is how they could impact yield is that they're either killing the plant or they're weakening, stunting the plant in which they're not producing uh, like they should. And so even in this case where you had a heavily infested field, out to 20 to 50 feet from the field edge, you're picking up basically no plants. The plants aren't, aren't surviving anymore. So that's something that's ongoing. Um, so depending on the size and the shape of the field, you know, sometimes uh, when you have some of those yield monitors and taking averages may not appear as severe, but depending if you have a smaller field, you could have pretty significant plant loss throughout the whole thing. So that's just something to keep in mind. This is an example of a farmer that I worked with who actually first alerted me to soybean gall midge in Iowa, in northwestern Iowa. And you guys are probably very familiar with looking at yield maps and um, basically in my simple mind, red, bad, green, good. And so he has these yield maps of, of, of uh, 
part of his farm where the highlighted maps show where he's growing soybeans. So he's in a corn soybean rotation here, flip flopping these kind of two irregular shape fields. He said he started to notice some plant injury, plant death, um, right between where those two fields meet up. And there wasn't really a lot of physical barriers between this. So the, those crops were butted up next to each other. And he wasn't sure if it was a pathogen or uh, other issues, but he said, I, I see plants that are dead. And so he got in contact with agronomists and our extension folks, and then finally alerted me. And he said, 2016, you know, we really have a problem. So I went up to visit him in 2017 and you can see the red area right where between those two crops is intensifying over years. Um, I can't say um, before 17 if it was midges or not, but that's just my best guess. So um, you could see, especially like in 16 and 17, um, it would be approximately 12 to 16 rows from the, from the field edge that he had nearly complete yield loss. And so there's very few surviving plants right along that border as he was harvesting. So you can see it's kind of a, a smaller, irregular shape field and it really impacted his overall yield for that season. And so in order to help farmers under, better understand and also help us understand, you know, how many midges does it take before we really should start caring about them? I wanted to develop an injury severity model with the help of our graduate student, Mitchell Helton, uh, again, co-advised by Justin. And my first thought was I want to uh, sort of copy a successful entomologist in the past. And then I, you know, automatically thought of the corn rootwormologists and how they have a, uh, created and now adapted this zero to three node injury scheme. Scale. So you may be familiar with that. So it's a predictive scale. So much injury is equivalent to a yield loss. So, so for example, for rootworms, a score of a one is 15% yield loss. And could we do something like that for soybean midge so that if someone is trying to make a management decision, they have so many midges or so many injured plants, they know about the, the yield loss to expect and are the management rescue costs worth it. And then especially with variable market values. And so we're hoping to get there. We aren't quite there yet, but we've made a lot of progress in two years. So I'm hoping this, this model will be a predictive value for farmers and then crop consultants and, and people working in agriculture. So um, if you've ever tried to count the number of larvae per plant, it's not easy. And I always thought like soybean aphid was hard, but this is way harder because they're inside the stem, so it involves a destructive sample and it's very time consuming and our team doesn't even really want to do it. So I wouldn't expect a farmer or, you know, a crop consultant to do it. So um, what I'm proposing to do is estimate the percent of injured plants. So they look stressed, the larvae are there, but I'm not trying to count every single one of those maggots. And so we've tweaked our scale a bit and ultimately what I hope to to end up with is a zero to three score represented by percent injury. So for example, a score of a one would be at least 25% plants injured, score of a two is at least 50%, and then a score of a three is at least 75%. And you can imagine, just like with rootworms, there's some in between. So you could have a 1.5, a 2.25, and so on. But we're hoping that this is something that is a little bit more palatable for when you're assessing either treatments or you're assessing maybe how your management is working in the field. And this is what we've come up with. The two summers of data, we've ended up with nearly uh, just over 550 data points where we are using that zero to three scale. And we're sort of piggybacking on a lot of other existing projects that were funded for biology and management. So a lot of that is replicated small plot work. And so we're evaluating those on a weekly basis on the zero to three. And uh, we've generated with the help of Nick Tinsley, he did a lot of this work for corn rootworm. Um, he's helped us develop a nonlinear regression model. And it includes injury scores and yield data from Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota. And again, we were, in most of these situations we were, were taking uh, ratings over weekly and that happened over the summertime. So we generated a lot of data points. And so um, you can see here, so it's, uh, it's we've, we've filled in an, a lot of information in this yield model. And so we have some fields that have low scores, we have fields that have high scores, and the yield potential is also uh, pretty variable. So again, we're not quite done with this model, but I'm hoping um, as he wraps up his master's degree, we'll have something that's a little bit more finalized and recommendations for people to use you know, this amount of entry is your best guess is this amount of yield loss. So 
Uh, with that, um, I just want to thank you for your time and interest. I know there's tons of questions coming in. I saw the orange button flying. So again, as research does get wrapped up, we're going to push it on to soybeangalmage.org. So I encourage you to uh, keep up with updates and then at future events as well. So thank you. As a question, have we looked at growing degree days to adult emergence? We did. Uh, on, yeah, this, is one of my, this is one of my other interests and in the severity injury model is building up degree day model. And that is really predictive that we use for a lot of other pests like corn rootworm. Um, we are taking, I'm taking degree day data at all my locations, um, but I feel like I, I won't be totally confident with a, an emergence, a degree day emergence model without having a colony in a lab. And right now it's just because, you know, I can take it at a few locations in the field, but I want to validate that with super controlled temperature and moisture. So I, I don't have that yet. I don't know if anyone else is, is looking at that. Oh. All I'll mention is the other species where that's been tried was the the accuracy was between five to seven days uh, for for their models that they worked on. So uh, you know, Aaron's I think taking the best possible shot at refining that data. And we're not we're in a different system, so there's a good chance we may have a more refined uh, model than than what they came up with. Yeah. Um, and and the initial run on broad data was that we hit kind of some wild values. So Aaron's kind of the point person to find that <laughs> for us. <laughs> Yeah, surprisingly close between Nebraska and Iowa for both years mm -hmm. within a few days as far as like first adult detected in the summer. But mm -hmm. so much is variable between those. I just know that we're not really, uh, we're not, we haven't refined that yet. Okay, there's a question. Are larvae susceptible to colder winter weather? I get, we discussed that previously. We think so, but we don't have any data really. Is that a reasonable uh, answer? It, it must be pretty cold hardy if they can survive Minnesota winters. Yeah, maybe just not cold enough yet. <laughs> if you want to get CCA credits, you can scan this QR code uh, as another option. So we'll, Phyllis wants to leave that up while we continue discussion. Uh, there's a question, is there any indication that the sweet clover infestations are gen genetically identical to those from fields of soybeans or are they a wild source? And, yeah. Uh, Justin, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's not me to directly answer that. that that's mm. Dr. Ana Velez's work. Uh, we don't have a, a specific answer to that so far with the sequence we're comparison, uh, comparing, they're the same, but uh, there's, there's a need to kind of go a bit deeper into the mitochondrial and nuclear DNA comparisons, which starts to float over my head. Uh, but just, just to tell you at a surface level, they appear the same, uh, but that's, that's not the full answer to that. Um, and, and there's a need to, to dial in on whether or not they move adequately between those hosts, I think, which is a question hiding behind that. Okay, there's a question. Do you see dying or dead plants in sweet clover and alfalfa? and just wondering how much the soybean gall midge might impact feed producers. I'll comment on Nebraska and shoot it off to the others. I've never seen a dead or dying uh, sweet clover plant from soybean gall midge infestations with some very high levels uh, or numbers, I should say, of uh, we can pick up to 200 on a single stem. They'll blacken, but the plant remains alive from what we've seen in East Central Nebraska. And in alfalfa, we haven't had high numbers on any alfalfa plant. They just found a few of them and, and they weren't, uh, you know, dying. It was just found a couple here and there. I've not seen them killing uh, either sweet clover or alfalfa like they do soybeans. Okay. Uh, do we know why infestations are higher near road ditches or tree lines? Only hypotheses uh, with, yeah. with the mowing. Uh, and we're kind of drawing a potential understanding that might be related to just heavy presence of dew or water that adults may need as they move between, uh, you know, a, a source and, and this year's soybean field. That might be conducive to survival, but we, we don't have any direct data besides observations with removing dense vegetation. That, that's all I got on that. I don't know if others have anything. Yeah, I, I think just in, for a lot of insects, they use that as a guide to find hosts as some of those physical barriers, but also some of the adults who are non-feeding, like soybean gallmage adults, maybe just use it for, for refuge to, to take a time out and they need some sort of 
vegetation just to kind of hang out for a while. But I, it's unknown, I would say, for soybean development. Yeah, because they are coming, emerging. Those first ones are emerging in pretty bare conditions, even if there are some, you know, corn seedlings growing. And so moving to those areas might just provide some protection and some moisture. And this is sort of a duplicate question, why the pest is attracted to the edge of the fields. Uh, I think we answered that already here. Uh, what is the trigger to start emergence? Good question. <laughs> We'd like to know too. <laughs> I mean, with, with a lot of insects is temperature, but it can't be modified by other things like we talked about, maybe moisture. Soil moisture might be a, f a factor as well. There's one, one note I, I should probably make, and I don't think I made it during the talk, is that our, our cages may not be totally accurate. In fact, they're more likely to not be totally accurate, and meaning that we may get emergence before we detect it in the cages. Uh, sure and, and this is an area of research not on there, but the need to move to some pheromone-based uh, you know, detection system is, is a, a priority and is what is used in other, other systems. So that that type of system would provide us with a, a clearer understanding of that relationship. But uh, first we have to isolate the pheromone, which Correct. hasn't been attempted yet, yes. Okay, another question is, uh, could dirt be mechanically ridged along the stem to protect the plants from egg laying since they lay in stem cracks? Smart people on this call. Yes. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> Uh, it's a great it's a great question. It's been brought up a number of times in conversation. Ridge tilling areas. I've not been able to find infestations in Nebraska. Uh, we thought about doing studies packing things around, and it certainly makes logical sense if they can't get to those areas. Um, I, I that's my thoughts. I don't know from observation. But yeah. they they can they can potentially infest higher in the plant if there's uh, openings. Yeah, I, and we've had conversations, the group of us, about wind-related stressors on plants. I know Bruce uh, mentioned that a couple meetings ago, uh, hail and other things that might, who knows what they'll do when they don't have access to that source and what they might try. Okay, another question. Uh, since we talked about a lot of situations where we have corn soybean rotations, uh, would you expect where less would soybeans all mids be less susceptible or sex, successful in areas where we have a higher percentage of continuous corn i have so, no research to back it up but my intuition says yes there are certain parts of at least iowa that have pretty intense continuous corn production and for me it it just means the midge would have to fly further and you know we don't know how far they can fly so how long they could survive you know by trying to find new fields i don't know i just think they would delay you know so they might not infest fields until later if they had to search longer i just don't have a good sense of how good of flyers they are or you just they also might diffuse in number so just yeah. diffusion is they move from a source you yep. they'd move around and even if they all survive they'd be diffused because it, they'd be you know yeah. fewer to get in any particular field possibly depending and that depends on also if they have any ways to focus in on a field from any distance, any cues or something like that. But if it's yep. a regular, regular insect kind of diffusion model, well, then it'd be probably less to infest any particular field. Okay. Is there any evidence of cover crop affecting midge populations? Yeah. Just to br briefly add to the, the previous one on our survey where we hit fields that were continue or had been corn all the previous year, we did find soybean gallmage in the midst of all those corn fields in the previous year, but you can't knock out the, the idea there may be a host nearby, another host other than soybean. Um, and there's a student that's got a survey that she's working on trying to look at the percentage of corn soybean in a given area. The, the uh, cover crop related question we've started and put in a study this past fall uh, since there are a number of students that are working on cover crops, it was an easy transition for them. I don't think we'll answer that this spring, uh, but we did plant cover crops both in an in, in infested soybean field that had finished out and in the adjacent corn field that's going to soybeans to see if the relationship with either one of those might influence infestation levels. Um, probably won't even have an answer if we meet in a year. <laughs> and then Janet Canodal 
responded to one of the questions in terms of effect of no-till that with other mid-species, uh, you have cooler soil, so it uh, delays emergence and uh, dry soil as the drip, as the midges from what she's seen, I'm assuming she's talking about the orange blossom wheat midge, uh, dry soil in late summer and fall when the midges drop off the plant cause increased mortality. So see if that relates to our species. And a uh, couple of questions here, uh, basically related to Aaron's, I don't know, Aaron, are you looking at the questions and answers? Yeah. <laughs> Can you yeah. see, there's a couple of questions here relative to uh, what you talked about, this, how the size and shape of the field affects things. Well, I, I hope I can understand the question. It says, is it, look, is it worth looking into where they overwinter? And I think Justin covered that. I think 98, 99% of where we're finding them based on soil sampling is within infested soybean fields. And so they, they overwinter, just drop to the ground. There's, there's not a lot of movement beyond those soybean field borders. I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding that, understanding the question right, but um, if there's grasses within the field or bordering the fields, I'm not sure if that helps or hurts a midge try to overwinter. Okay. And once injury happens to the soybean plant, will we still have opportunities for, to con for control? We don't have an answer to that one. I don't have an <laughs> yeah. answer. Yeah. Yep. You'll, you'll see some of the management information that we've come up with or data collected and there's room on that one. Okay, there's a question. Any correlation with incidence of gall midge and stem bore? Uh, I don't know that we have an answer to that. Uh, a lot of, we, we see a lot of, a lot of stem, we see gall midge uh, damage in areas where we don't have stem bore, I know that. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've seen both on the same plant and I've seen them in the absence of either one. So they don't seem to, at least on limited observations. And stem bore, like you say, Bob, peters out as you go north. Yeah. So my area, you know, you have very little dectes. I mean, you can find them here and there, but uh, so it's, you know, we do know that they're very able to infest fields without stem bore. Yeah. And, uh, if people find stem borers and sweet clover, would would uh, you like to know where they find them and perhaps send samples? Do you want to further document that? Oh yeah, soybean gallmage. That's Lauren Botine. I see. Yeah. We've sent us samples and it works yeah. with Erin through her masters. We would we would greatly appreciate them, Lauren. <laughs> that's very helpful than the samples you sent the previous year. And anybody who wanted to send them down, that helps build the understanding on this. Okay, another question we don't have the answer to, but why are soybean gall midge found in some soybean fields in the county and not in others, even in very close proximity? Why are they not more widespread? Yeah, I think they're not terribly great flyers. And so mm -hmm. they only fly as far as they need to to find a host for their offspring. And I've seen that even within a farm, you know, you have a couple of fields that they just bounce back and forth and they never make it to some of those uh, those those farm the fields that are more scattered so i don't know if you've had that experience too justin even within like across the road why they pick some to invest and why not others man yeah that, that i really like those questions because it makes you think about a lot of different things uh, one is a possible management tactic that failed us on in 2020 which is delayed planting uh, late enough plantings in 2019 avoided infestations nearly entirely in east central nebraska so that, that may have set back those infestations for the following year as sources. Um, but, you know, surveying the state, it was, it was surprising to go from one area of extreme injury out to another area that, that, is, that has virtually nothing. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of questions tied up in that for research, not a lot of answers at the moment. Let's see, do you think such some plants such as sweet clover are naturally resistant and they might be closer to a natural host? It's, it's a well, reasonable- they tolerate. Uh, Go ahead. The sweet clover does tolerate quite a few, I don't know if you want, you know, does tolerate quite a few uh, 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 midges on it without showing any, you know, physiological problems with the upper part of the plant that we can tell. Now we haven't taken dry matter or seed compared them, but they seem to be quite healthy uh, sweet clover. 
but uh, you know, so we do, they do seem to tolerate it more, but as any further than that, I can't say. Has yeah. anybody tried to monitor a burnt road ditch to see how that might affect soybean gall midge? Uh, all I know is that growers have called me to report they burned waterways between fields and saw significant reductions, but uh, those are confounded with those field locations because we don't have adequate checks in there unburned to compare to. Um, and so that's that's the critical part. If you're going to approach this on, on your farm, uh, you know, give one of us a call and we can help you to make sure we, we get a good understanding of what's happening. I'm trying to go through the chat too to see if there were some questions we missed. Yeah, uh, Russell asked if there's any correlation between midges and Phytophthora. Uh, not that I, not that we have research in any in depth. Sometimes the plants have Phytophthora, sometimes they don't, but they're not necessarily have to be there. And I, I think when they've done an assessment of plants uh, that were infested and looked at different diseases in them, there's up to a, at least six or seven that they've found in association. But when they try to find a real pattern, they haven't found that yet. Like if one stands out instead of the other. And then of course we do know you can get infestation without any disease presence too. We, we have a currently funded Nebraska soybean project looking at, at uh, disease interactions as well with, with a ridiculous amount of fungicide you know, applications that would be totally un uneconomical. The, the reason for it is to see if we can kind of eliminate that part of the equation and what it does. Uh, we've got one year of that. And to be honest with you, the site didn't have as much pressure as anticipated, which is interesting. It's been three years of soybeans now. Um, and there's some questions there, but uh, I, I think hopefully over the next two years of research, we'll get a clearer and clearer understanding of that if there is an interaction. Yeah, and someone earlier had asked about maybe some potential interactions of soybean aphid, and I, I don't know the answer to that when it comes to midges, but in previous work, anytime there's a competitor with soybean aphid, like spider mites, uh, any type of defoliator, soybean cyst nematode, or uh, fungal diseases, soybean aphids are the loser, and they never do very well when there's an, any type of competition. So I could imagine because of where they're feeding, uh, the midges of where they're feeding and they're gonna interfere with nutrient uptake to the top of the plant where aphids like to be, that aphids won't do very well in plants that are invested with midges. It's just my best guess. I might, I might be wrong, but I thought the focus of that was if we spray for soybean aphids, would that affect oh. soybean gall midge? Oh, uh, okay, yeah. that I can't answer. Yeah. It would really I, depend oh. on the timing and a whole bunch of other factors. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And we, I doubt it. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. Let's see, in the a few more Q&A questions. Uh, has anybody tried burning the soybean stubble and seeing how that affects emergence? And the answer is I, no, I think, right? Yeah, I can't tell if it's because uh, it's burry, burying. I can't tell if it's burying, like burying it below uh, soil surface or burning. So if they want to clarify Okay, that. yeah. Uh, but you know, we have, we have tillage again, that'll come up on the 19th because uh, I'm burning, 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 we'll yes. okay. <laughs> burning. no, <laughs> we haven't. <laughs> uh, okay. We and, uh, I don't know if you're going to be talking about this next week, Justin, the question about, uh, variety, variety resistance or tolerance. We are doing some work in that area. Yep. Yep. Teaser. Uh, Aaron did a big part of the participation on this and Tom, uh, we 760 some lines were tested through the germplasm. So we'll tell you the answer. You have to come back in the 19th. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a, there's a lot of years ahead of that. So you won't, even the answers are not going to give you uh, much. Yeah. Wow. A, a good range out. We're still not done. A uh, good range of questions. We really appreciate this. I think we're closing in on 40 questions asked. So mm -hmm. this is why we're here. Uh, so we, we appreciate it. The question is, uh, anybody tried to look at repellents like uh, uh, chemical ex plant extracts, mar mar marigold, citronella off? <laughs> it is a fly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Keith, that's, that's an awesome question. Nobody's looked at that. Uh, I I like these because we tend to, we jot these down uh, and, and keep them, you know, when we're all discussing what to go after next. So um, yeah, good question. Yeah, I guess my only reaction would be some of these are, are not very persistent. So that if they had an effect, it may not be very long lasting. But That's a good point, Bob. 
Okay, I think I've got most of... We've exhausted them. Yes. <laughs> or our answers are insufficient. They've given up on us. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing. We've just started the research. We've got a couple years on some of our projects. Um, we do have some, you know, anecdotal types of information, such as, you, you know, uh, you know, I've had consultants that have sprayed quite a bit in fields uh, at, at, at soybean aphid time at other times during the season, and they have not seen any real effect that year or the following year on the adjacent field, but that's anecdotal. It's not a study. The same with burning. I wouldn't think burning soybean stubble, you know, by the time you could burn soybean stubble, those larvae would be in the ground most likely. So I wouldn't think that would have an effect, but we haven't tested it. So that's just the nature, that is the nature of this, where at the first couple years of really intensive study, and it usually takes two to three years for just about any study to yield uh, what I would call, you know, results with, 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 with which we have, uh, you know, confident, real confidence in. And I think there's one thing we found out the first two years is, boy, this thing is quite variable. And so you see something one year, and then you see uh, something different the next looking at the same question or you see maybe something similar but then something added on so so uh, it's an ongoing process and we we're filling in blanks as we go but right now there's a lot a lot of questions still um, yeah. yeah so so Phyllis if people are having any trouble with their CCA CEU um, should they get in contact with you I know we had a few snags last week Absolutely, get in touch with me. I'll put my um, email in the chat box. Okay. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to help out with that. Let us know if you still need that QR code. I guess it's a little bit faster than uh, adding to the form. Yeah, Phyllis is who we go to when we have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? Yeah, I'll add one to, to Tom's, uh, you know, there's a lot of really interesting discussion. And I think, you know, we could sit around as a group on here and, and talk for hours about this insect and ideas uh, is I've been surprised over the last two years, how un unprofitable in terms of research my soybean on soybean sites have been. Uh, and that surprised me. I, I'm, I don't think all of us have had the same observation year to year. Uh, but but it, it is, uh, you know, I've, I've had growers come to me and say, I'm just going to put the whole field at risk and I'll plant it right back to soybeans and you guys will get an awesome study. And we're like, yeah, let's do it. And we'll go back into that field. And, and it's one of the lowest pressured fields I had this year. Um, and so I know the observations are not the same in every location, but those types of things surprise me uh, on the expectations we have in this insect. Yeah. And my, my experience is opposite. When I planted research in 2019, it was soybean in the previous year and it was like a blowout, like almost no, no plants were surviving. So it was very intense. Um, so it's like Tom said, it's really variable. Mm -hmm. think? We've been, we've been saving a lot of the management questions for, for next week. So uh, please join us again and hopefully we can do the same thing. A lot of, <laughs> Yeah, I imagine next week will be a nice culminating day and we'll probably yeah. have quite a, yeah. yeah. So tell your friends, your coworkers, come back for our last session. And it gives us a chance to think about some of those management questions too, you know. Yeah, we appreciate them in advance. It's nice to know those are questions you have. And as we hit management, we can, we can try and better address those. Hey, thank you, everybody. I guess this is it for today. Okay, bye, folks. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye.